D&D number four, Weeds Grow in Jesus' Name, chapter 18. Beth cowered as the television crashed to the floor. She was now truly afraid. Tommy had gone berserk, throwing everything he could get his hands on. The acclaim the Kinos were receiving on the morning news was driving him out of his mind. She only hoped that all this would drive him to end this ridiculous revenge thing one way or the other. She needed it to be over. She had accepted that she was going to die a long time ago, but she also finally realized that she wanted to do it peacefully and comfortably in a bed. She hadn't been feeling well. She had a constant headache now, severe nausea. She was weak and tired. She was done. All the plans she'd made to help her family had gone wrong. It seemed a very long time ago that she was a high school junior cheering at the varsity squad, on the varsity squad, madly in love with her boyfriend, happy. Then it had all come crashing down. She would have been a senior now, an innocent, happy senior whose worst problem was what to wear to school or getting the cliff notes for a book she didn't want to read. In the past six months, she learned more about life than she'd ever wanted to know. She'd learned about hatred and violence. She'd learned sexual things she never could have imagined. She'd learned how good and how bad people could be. Shelley was good. Tommy was bad. Why she hadn't seen that earlier was beyond her. How naive could a person be? If she hadn't been so blind, she could have told the Kinos what Tommy had asked of her. She could have switched sides and they would have protected her. Of course, at the time, Tommy hadn't shown his full colors. She'd still been a little taken with him. She'd been so stupid. She couldn't really blame Ricky for trying to send her home. He'd been angry that she'd hurt their family, and she had, in so many ways. She'd wreaked havoc. She was so very, very sorry. Then listening to what Tommy had done to Ricky, she still had nightmares over it. She heard him grunting in pain, cursing at Tommy, and when he cried out, she'd felt sick. He'd been so brave, and he'd tried to give his life for his family. Beth curled herself into a ball and tried to be invisible. Maybe Tommy would forget he had her. Maybe he'd storm off and just leave. She could always hope. <clears throat> New scene. There's the man, Joey yelled as he and Mark came out onto the deck from the dining room. Ricky sat in a full lotus, his eyes closed. The boys came to him, patting his back and ruffling his hair. I'm meditating, guys, Ricky said softly. Too bad about that, Mark answered. Today, this morning, you get the royal treatment. Joey, grab his legs. Mark lifted Ricky from under his arms, and Joey grabbed his legs. They carried him down the terrace deck and dumped him unceremoniously into the swimming pool. Ricky sprang out and chased each one down and tossed them in, then dove back in himself. They stood in a circle in the water talking about the fight laughing over mistakes Ricky had made, but mostly gloating how he'd kicked butt big time. Ricky happily accepted their accolades. He was glad he could make them proud. They wouldn't have been if they'd seen him an hour ago, hung over and sick. He'd showered, made himself an herbal remedy, prayed and meditated. He'd peeked in at Bree, but decided he didn't want to face that yet. His right hand was swollen, his forehead was sore, and his entire body ached, but he'd be okay as soon as Bree forgave him. He hoped it wouldn't be too long. New scene. Eric tossed the newspaper down on the kitchen table. Might as well get this over with now, he said calmly. Bree slowly picked up the paper, folded to a picture of Ricky in the ring, his arms raised in triumph with a caption proclaiming his mighty victory. Underneath that were three smaller pictures, one of Bree being kissed by Ricky in the ring, the next of Ricky with the two blondes on his lap, and the third was a close-up of Bree with tears running down her face. Placing the paper carefully back on the table, she rose. Excuse me, she said softly. Ricky and the boys were coming in from the pool when Bree passed them without a glance. Hey, hun, I guess you're still mad at me, Ricky asked jovially. She glared at him. I wouldn't speak to me right now if I were you. He watched her walk upstairs. Shelley passed Ricky and handed him the paper. She just saw this. He looked it over. Ugh, worse than I thought. He looked up at Shelley. You got any ideas as to how to make this better? Shelley smiled sweetly. If I did, 
I wouldn't tell you. You have to figure this one out on your own. It will help you to not be so inconsiderate next time. Ricky looked past Shelley to his father. Dad, have I ever helped you to find the easy way out of anything? No. Then why would you think I'd do it now? I guess I lost my mind for a moment. Joey patted Ricky's shoulder. Let her stew. She'll eventually get over it. Great, thanks, Joey. He turned to Shelly. It looks like you've got some teaching to do. Shelly eyed her son. Yes, it does. She looked over at Mark. And what do you have to say? Um, Bree's my sister, and Ricky had better do whatever it takes to make her happy. Close enough, Shelly said. Joey muttered something crude. Mommy, Jeffy said as she came into the kitchen. Bree's crying. Don't worry, little one. Ricky's going to take care of that. You are, Ricky? <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm going to try, he said softly, bending to give her a hug. Well, go. She put her hands on her hips. Right now. Okay, okay. Darn pushy females, he mumbled as he left the kitchen. I'm hungry, Mommy, Jeffy said. Well, good. Daddy's going to take over and make you breakfast. I am? Yes, she raised her nose in the air. I mean, that's fine, but... I get the feeling that you're upset with me. Did I say something wrong? Your son did. You heard what he said as he left. And you're mad at me for something he said? He's your son, and you should have addressed that. And you know what? He was your son last night, and you were there. And even if he didn't realize the consequences of his actions, you should have. She turned and left the room. New scene. Ricky knocked softly as he entered the room. He didn't ask permission to come in because he knew she'd just say no anyway. She lay on her bed, her back to the door. He sat down on the side of the bed behind her. You said last night you knew this was coming. I also said I was going to be upset about it. And I am. I'm sorry, Bree. You've already said that. Then what else can I do? She rolled over. You can tell me what you've learned. Here was his chance, he thought. Don't blow it. I've learned that a small, selfish, insensitive act can cause a lot of problems. Problems for who? For everyone. She lay quietly. Did I pass? I guess, but I still don't feel any better. You said a few weeks ago you didn't care what the papers print about us. I didn't when they were printing how much we loved each other. Now they're making me out to be a fool. I'm pretty certain all their men are thinking that I'm the one who's a fool. Not the great Ricky Kino. You can do no wrong. We both know that's not true, Bree. We can't have a relationship based on what the media prints about us. We just have to interact with each other and those we love. You're the only person I really have to answer to. Just you. She sighed. He moved closer. He lay down beside her and propped on his elbow and looked down at her face. Bree. Do you know why I needed so badly to fight in that competition? To show the world what a great fighter you are? To show everyone how manly you are? Because you were bored? I wanted to impress you. I wanted to prove myself to you. I wanted you to be proud of me and what I can do. I wanted you to understand what it is I do and appreciate my art as much as I do. She stared up into his face. So you're saying you did it for me? Well, I needed to share myself with you. I needed you to know me. Her hand reached up and stroked his cheek. I thought I did know you, Ricky. Yet every day I learn more about you. Every day I'm more impressed. If you were trying to impress me last night, well, you accomplished that tenfold. I was trying, and I'm glad I succeeded because I love you, Brianna. Lord, how I love you, and every day I know you, I love you more. You're such a mixture of people. You are so very sweet, and I'm not sweet. Oh, you're sweeter than sweet. The way you are with Jeffy and your brothers, the way you took care of your mom when she was having such a hard time, the little things you do that you think nobody notices, you're sweet. What about that man you saved from Florida? You never even mentioned it. Her mouth opened wide. How did you know about that? It was in the news, didn't you know? No one ever contacted me about it. Well, there was a picture and a short article. 
I guess there's been so much else going on since you've been home that I haven't thought to mention it. See what I mean? It was a wonderful, selfless thing you did, and you didn't even give it a second thought. Bree, you are an amazing woman. You're feisty and strong and smart and nobody's pushover. You're so dedicated to your family and to your career. She frowned. What's left of it? He sighed. Were you a phenomenal actress yesterday? If you say so. Then you still are today. It doesn't matter what the media says. She frowned. I wanted to be the one with you last night. I know, Bree. I'm a, I was an insensitive idiot, but I, I can't turn back time. Well, you seem to be able to do the impossible. He smiled. Sometimes, not always. How about doing this? How about you make all this stuff with Tommy go away? It's really getting to you, isn't it? Her eyes closed briefly. Ricky, I haven't said anything about this because I didn't want to sound like a big baby. You were recovering, and then I pulled that stupid stunt. After all, I brought it on myself, but I've been having a tough time with something. He stroked her face. Tell me what you're talking about. She drew a deep breath. I thought I was having a relationship with an ex-cop with my bodyguard, my bodyguard, and it turns out Tommy Crane, the brother of the man who tried to murder my mother, was having his way with me out of spite. I've been sick over it. I keep seeing his hands on me. I keep seeing the times I so willingly gave myself to him, and then I get physically ill. He used me. He abused me. And I feel violated. And I can't seem to get it out of my mind. And I think feeling the way I do is what pushed me to try to do something about all of this. Oh, hon, he said, pulling her to him. She laid her head on his chest. I didn't know you were having these feelings. I really am an insensitive idiot. We've already established that, he chuckled. You see, you see how strong you are? You just told me how much all this hurts you, yet you turn around and make a joke. I don't know what else to do. It hurts so bad. I would help. It would help to talk about it. If not to me, then with your mom or my dad. Well, let's just start with you. I don't think I could talk to anyone else about it. Okay. Then tell me. Tell me everything he did, everything he said to you. Tell me exactly how he made you feel and how it makes you feel now. Dirty, she began. She went on to tell him everything she could remember from his first sweet words to her, to her sed seduction, to her realization that he was not a nice guy, and finally to her finding out who he really was. She told him how she'd found out shortly after Ricky had returned home from the hospital, and she couldn't very well complain about her hurt feelings when she was so grateful just to have him home. Ricky held her and stroked her and whispered comforting words in her ear, and when she finally cried, he stayed quiet and listened to her heart-wrenching sobs. He burned with the need to put all this to an end for her, for her, for him, for Jeffy, and for his family. New scene. What are you doing? Bree asked Ricky several days later as she peered into his bedroom. I'm working on something. She came in, approached where he sat at his computer desk, typing out an email. What? He smiled at her. It's a surprise. What kind of surprise? He sighed. Well, I won't be able to keep it a secret anyway. He hit send and spun around in the chair to face her. Sit down. She sat on the bed. I'm all ears. He looked her over. Nope, you're definitely not. Anyway, I was thinking about my little competition last week and my need to share my art with you. And I was wondering if maybe you had the same need, you know, to share your art with me. I mean, I've seen your movies. I've seen rehearsals. I know what an extraordinary actress you are, but I've never been able to see you work close up. Her brow furrowed. So you want to come and watch me next time I do a movie shoot? No. Well, yes. Just listen. I want to work with you. I'm an okay actor. You're an exquisite actress. My publicist has been in touch with your manager, and they're talking about us doing a movie together. A movie about us. We would play ourselves. We could tell our real story the way we want it presented. I've been told it's very romantic, and with all the stuff with the Crane Brothers, there's plenty of action and suspense. 
They've already asked Lou Dietz to work on a screenplay to present to you. What do you think? Well, what does my manager think? Well, she's excited about it, but she's waiting on the screenplay before she approaches you. I was supposed to wait, too, but I guess I'm not very good at keeping secrets. It could be good for us, like you said. We could tell the real story, and I could work with you, and I could get to watch what you do. She smiled. I'd like that, I think. I'd like you to see what I put into my roles, into my art. So it's a tentative yes? I think so, she said, nodding. He looked her over. She was looking very radiant. Her hair was taken up in a clip. Her eyes shone. She wore jeans and a light sweater. So, Shelley says, you were out shopping. Actually, I went to the doctor. He was immediately concerned. Is everything okay? Everything is perfect. I've been given a clean bill of health. He frowned. Yeah, but we still have a week to go of our six-week sentence. I know, but I went to the doctor because I don't want to wait another day. <clears throat> another minute. I need to be with you. He swallowed, and the doctor has given his okay? She smiled sweetly. He has. You're telling me the truth? I promise I will never lie to you, Ricky. Never. I promise you the same thing. She smiled and started unbuttoning her blouse. Ricky put his hand on hers to stop her. Wait, I'm sorry. We need to talk. About what? He gestured toward her hand on her blouse. About this. Okay. Are you saying you don't want to? Oh, I want to. So much. He went on to explain to her his beliefs. He dove deep even telling her about his father's experience in the cave. He explained how his relationship with Jesus Christ is what shaped him and made him into the person he is. He confessed to her how he'd stumbled and the pain it caused. He explained to her God's laws and how following them can not only keep us close to God, but keep us safe. He even used her relationship with Tommy as an example, for it would never have happened if she'd known and followed God's laws. She certainly couldn't argue with that. As Ricky explained to her his innermost thoughts and feelings, her respect for him didn't diminish, but instead grew. Her mother had told her there was no such thing as a perfect man, but Bree thought Ricky came pretty darn close. When she expressed that to him, he became very serious. He shook his head. There's only been one man who was perfect, and that was Jesus. I want to be like him. I try. I fail each and every day. I lust. I curse. I get angry. I'm prideful. I have hatred in my heart sometimes. It's a long list. But I won't ever stop trying to be like Jesus. Well, a man with those kinds of goals would make the best husband and the best father. He reached out and touched her face, gently caressing her cheek. I'm glad you feel that way. He left it at that. It wasn't that he wasn't going to pop the question but the ring hadn't come in yet, just a little longer. New scene. Tommy grabbed her by the hair. I said, get up. Her head lolled back. Please, Tommy, I can't stand this anymore. He shook her. What's wrong with you? I'm sick, Tommy. I hurt all over. I'm dizzy. I don't think I can stand. He pulled her up. Get up. We're out of here. He let her go and she fell over and he hefted her over his shoulder. She moaned in pain. Where are we going? She asked between clenched teeth. You'll see soon enough. This is it, Beth, baby. Today is the day your little girlfriend dies. Please, Tommy, what are you going to do? I keep telling you, it's you who's going to do it. No, never. He only smiled as he tossed her into the newest mode of transportation. Get in the truck. I'm taking you somewhere. No one will find you while I go get the kid. You're going back to jail. You know that. Shut up. You hurt that kid and they're going to fry you. Not here in California. I'm not talking about the state. I'm talking about the Kinos. Well, we'll just see about that. New scene. Well, we have a house full of people this morning, Bree said as she entered the kitchen. Shelly smiled at her daughter. Eric decided to move his business meeting here this morning, which is why Justin is here. I think they're going to try to bring Jason down on his security fees, Shelly joked. Other than them, it's just the usual group of studly Ameritech agents. Bree grinned as the agents shifted uncomfortably. 
She winked at Jeff. Of course, eight of us are leaving in just a little bit, Shelley added. Who's leaving? Ricky asked as he joined the group. Well, Mark and Joey are off to school along with their guardians, and Jeffy and I, and our shadows, are also leaving. Where are you going? Bree asked. The museum, Jeffy said. They're having a special kids day, and I'm going to learn about archaeology, which is actually the study of humans by learning about their artifacts. That's like old stuff. It's important to know about so that you'll know how to do things better than they used to do a long time ago and to help us evolve. I like to learn stuff. I know, Bree said, smiling at her sister. And you like to talk about it, too. And Daddy says that's okay, that it's good for me to express myself, but I have to learn that there's a time and place for everything, and that sometimes I need to speak and sometimes I need to be quiet. And I've been working real hard at being quiet, especially when the grown-ups are talking about serious issues, even though I usually know what you're talking about anyway. Ricky laughed and scooped her up. You, Munchkin, are a trip. Joey just said the same thing to me. Joey looked up from the kitchen table where he was downing a bowl of cereal. That's because you are. Come over here and help me with my homework. She giggled. I can't help you, Joey. You have to learn to do everything on your own or you won't retain it. Right, Mommy? Shelly grinned. That's right, Angel Face. Mark looked up from eating breakfast. Well, can you come here and give your brother a big hug and kiss? Sure, Jeffy said. She climbed onto Mark's knee and hugged him and kissed his cheek. There, now I can go off to school and feel happy. Don't worry, Mark, Jeffy said. You'll find a new girlfriend soon, and you won't feel unhappy anymore. The family all turned to see the expression on Mark's face. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Mark said, rolling his eyes. That's okay. Soon, everything is going to be all better. The police will catch Tommy and put him in jail, so Ricky won't have to kill him, and Beth will be okay and be able to go home to her mom and dad. Her hand flew to her mouth. Oops. I wasn't supposed to tell you that I knew that. I heard you talking about it. Sorry. Anyway, soon we'll be able to go places by ourselves, and I'll get to start sleeping in my own room again. You don't like sleeping in Mom and Eric's room? Mark asked. Oh, I don't mind too much, but I miss my stuff, and Mommy isn't getting any sleep. Why do you say that? Shelley asked. Oh, I heard you tell Daddy that... That with me in the room, you weren't getting any, and Daddy said he would take you to a hotel and you could have as much as you wanted all night long. The room erupted. What? Jeffy asked, her mouth turning down into a frown. Shelley whirled toward Eric. Don't you dare tell her. He shrugged. She needs to know about these things. Okay, but not yet, and not here, and not now. Please. Eric smiled. Okay, but you two should probably have a talk while you're spending time together today. Yes, we'd better, Shelley said. On that note, Joey laughed. We got to get to school. Bye, all. Mark and Joey made their exit as the rest of the family moved into the great room. Come on, Jeffy, Shelley said. Let's get ready to go to the museum. We want to be there by nine. Jeffy was still frowning as Shelley took her hand and they went upstairs to get their purses. They returned a few minutes later and started toward the front door where Barry, one of the agents who would be accompanying them, held it open. Do I get a goodbye kiss from my girl, Eric said. Yes, they both answered at the same time. Eric scooped Jeffy up into his arms. Bye, Daddy, she said. Bye, baby, I love you. Have fun and take care of your mom for me. I will, I promise. He kissed her gently and set her down. Shelly stepped close. Eric reached out, placing his hands on her shoulders and slowly pulled her against his body. His arms came around her and he kissed her long and slow and passionately. Ricky cleared his throat. Um, there are other people in the room. Eric looked up. Huh? Oh, yes. Well then. Bye, Shelley. She headed toward the door, then turned back. Why don't you make that reservation? He smiled gladly. He nodded toward Barry. You and Cole take good care of them. Yes, sir. We'll be right behind them the entire time. Right beside them the entire time. So what's this you've got laid all, o all over the dining room table, Ricky asked when they'd left. Justin and I are about to go over financial reports for the quarter. Stick around, you'll learn something. Bree shrugged. We just might do that. I'd like to see what you guys have been doing with all my hard-earned money. Not that I'd understand any of it. I was thinking, Dad, Ricky said. What with me living at home lately? Maybe I should be contributing to the household income. Eric frowned. Don't insult me. Ricky shrugged. I just felt like I should acknowledge the fact that I realize I've been living here and eating here. Then acknowledge it. Just don't insult me. 
New scene. Let's play a game while we drive, Ricky. Uh, Let's play a game while we drive, Jeffy said. Like what? Shelly asked. Like, let's make words out of license plates. You too, Mr. Cole, and you too, Mr. Barry, if you can still do it while you drive. He smiled into the rearview mirror of the BMW 750 sedan. I'll do my best, but I'd better be careful. Your mommy would want, wouldn't want me to mess up her car. Okay. I see O-G-N. Um, that's origin. Very good word, Shelly said. Your turn, mommy. Okay, I see S-L-G. She touched Jeffy's nose. That's silly little girl. Ha ha, mommy, but you're not doing it right. It's not an anagram. It has to be one word, like S-L-G would be slug. Oh, so sorry. It's okay. Now it's your turn, Mr. Cole. Cole waited for another car to pass. Okay, A-M-N. Um, amen, or American. Or almond, or amend, or that's enough, Jeffy giggled. Okay, Mr. Barry, Shelley gasped as a big black F-250 passed them within inches. Did you see that truck, Barry? Barry nodded. He had to be doing well over a hundred, idiot. Barry's voice sounded calm enough, but he eyed his companion. Cole's expression was very serious. He removed his belt and turned in his seat to look over into the back of the vehicle. He reached toward Jeffy, who sat behind Barry. I'm just checking your seatbelt, Jeffy, he said as he tugged on the belt. Mrs. Keno, you're good, your belt good and tight? Shelley looked up, questioning. Yes, it's fine. What's going on? What are you thinking? No coincidences, remember? The car slowed, and Shelley peered up over the seat. He's coming back, Barry said. He glanced at Cole. I'm calling in. Cole pulled out his cell, cell keeping an eye on the black truck heading toward them. What's happening, Mommy? I'm not sure. Hold on, baby. Shelly grabbed Jeffy's hand. I'm scared, Mommy. Okay, darling. It's going to be okay. I want Daddy. Me too. I've got to get some speed to try to avoid him. The car zoomed forward. Shelly could see now the truck that had just flown past them was coming down the hill from the opposite direction, in their lane. He's coming right at us. Hold it steady, Cole said as he pushed the number one on his phone. He'll turn off. I don't think so. I think it's kamikaze time. Hold it. Steady. Hold it. Barry waited. If he maneuvered away too soon, the truck driver would just adjust and ram them anyway. He had to wait until the last possible moment, and that moment was coming fast. He jerked the wheel to the right. The beamer skidded on the shoulder. Barry tried to regain control, but over-adjusted. The car rolled. The sound of Jeffy and Shelley screaming and glass breaking and metal crunching filled the morning air. They finally came to rest upright. Shelly grimaced in pain. Her legs were pinned by the front passenger seat. She couldn't see Cole. Barry was pinned between his seat and the steering wheel. Jeffy was crying but appeared to be okay. Shelly reached for her hand. I'm here, baby, Shelly said. We're okay. We're okay. Shh, now. Someone will be coming soon and they'll help us. Can you get out Barry asked, pushing against the steering wheel that was wedged against his chest. He was struggling to breathe. Shelly shook her head. No, I'm pinned by the seat. He closed his eyes. Jeffy, can you get out of your seat? Yes, I can, she said as she calmed down. I need you to go hide in those woods. Can you do it? I don't want to leave Mommy. You have to, baby, Shelly said, unable to keep the tears from running down her cheeks. Mommy will be all right, I promise. Now you have to go. You have to do what Barry says because he knows his job and he knows how to protect you. Now go. She unstrapped her seatbelt, obeying the command, but she started to cry. I don't want to leave you. Why do I have to go? They heard the truck when it pulled up beside them and Barry knew it was too late. Please, Jesus, help us, Shelly cried. Barry struggled to get his arm out of its holster. He grunted in pain as he pushed against the steering wheel. When Tommy's face appeared at her broken window, Jeffy threw herself into her mother's arms, and Tommy grabbed the door handle. It was stuck. He had to jerk on it several times before it finally opened. He peered into the car. Well, well, finally, I get to meet the little brat. And that is the end of Chapter 18. Booyah.